anyway uh, uh, what i would say that uh, these are uh, organisms as you know we uh, had in the morning you know uh, these probiotics role of lactobacillus but besides that uh, uh, we could also find that these organisms are also able to degrade pesticides so the diversity uh, as well as efficiency of all these organisms vary uh, from one organism to the other like if we talk about human beings we all have different uh, energies different capacities different potentials so similarly these microorganisms also have different potentials but uh, cyanobacteria bacteria as a whole i would say they have a higher photosynthetic efficiency because they are having higher photosynthetic efficiency they are faster growth rate and that's why accumulate more biomass and uh, of course um, uh, they do not require much of the nutrients to uh, basically multiply so we say that they are easily culturable uh, easily controllable environmental conditions if you just go around and see uh, i would say your surroundings you will see you know wherever some moisture is available these organisms will be able to flourish and grow and uh, you will be able to isolate them and whether we talk about some inhospitable environments there also you will find these organisms okay and then round the year production uh, we you can modulate these so that the whole year these production can be taken up and of course uh, it is well known that uh, as i told you they are uh, very good managers for uh, i would say protecting the environment so they are non polluting and environment friendly and they are not contributing to any uh, increase in co2 or other i would say uh, these uh, gases which are harmful well looking into all these things all the advantages all the applications uh, these organisms have uh, the department of biotechnology government of india way back in 1986 they established this particular center for conservation and utilization of blue green algae and in fact uh, incidentally uh, i joined in 1986 as scientist and i directly joined this particular center and uh, this center also so came into existence the same year and uh, we are housing about uh, 700 uni algal cultures with us and these isolates uh, it's a continuous process of enriching the germplasm characterizing these and uh, basically we are following the polyphasic approach to characterize these organisms and well these cultures are again they are preserved with the best possible ways uh, of long term preservation as well as short term preservation and these organisms are is a collection from pan india as well as from outside india and uh, anybody who is working on uh, these organisms uh, i would request or i would say that uh, they can deposit because Uh, once you are working with some organisms maybe at a later stage uh, you shift your uh, i would say interests or maybe you are leaving the place then the organisms are lost there is no one to take care of those organisms so these germplasm collections these repositories are meant for such purpose that the organisms which are there having some specific i would say applications or attributes they should not be lost but uh, in my opinion uh, an organism uh, we talk about uh, i would say endangered species we say that uh, this plant species or this animal is getting endangered in this particular region uh, but for microorganisms i would say every organism is an endangered species if it is lost it is lost forever you cannot re isolate the replica of that again okay so we have to really preserve these organisms in the best possible way and that is my i would say appeal to all the researchers that it's not that i am saying that you deposit here there are other collections also wherever you find it you try to whenever the students you complete your phd try to hand over your cultures to your chairperson so that these cultures on which you have worked upon they can be utilized in future
well just a glimpse of some of these cultures which are there in our germplasm all heterocysts non heterocysts unicellular all these things are there and if you wish to work on any of these organisms uh, these are freely available to you uh, with the procedure to be followed okay uh, well coming to the application of these organisms of course you name any field uh, these organisms have their application whether we talk about food feed biochemicals biofuel biofertilizers biogas the very fine chemicals the valuable chemicals uh, talk about bioremediation the nutraceuticals all these applications are there with one or the other kind of cyanobacteria responsible or may be used for that particular application some of these uh, things we i'll be talking about well first of all the pigments and biochemicals uh, the, these are the i would say repository of many of these pigments the phycobilly proteins the carotenoids and of course chlorophyll which is there and then besides that antioxidants many other health promoting compounds the phenolics the flavonoids essential fatty acids vitamins bioplastics all these things have been reported and worked upon exclusively and extensively by uh, various uh, workers okay so uh, we uh, at iari have worked on uh, the pigment phycobilly proteins and these phycobilly proteins are basically further classified based upon their spectrum into phycocyanin allophycocyanin phycoerythrin and phycoerythrocyanin and besides that some of these cyanobacteria have also been reported with some a uh, couple of other uh, i would say these phycobilly proteins but these phycobilly proteins are high value pigments and the value of these pigments is basically based upon the purity of the these ones and of course uh, they have their applications in uh, cosmetics they in food as well as in uh, immunologicals analytics uh, nutraceuticals uh, all these things are there uh, which is there and we at uh, iara in our lab we have come out with a very economical one step process for extraction of these pigments initially you know uh, uh, the organisms are grown and then the pigment is extracted using uh, uh, some buffers of course we have optimized the whole process uh, normally the phosphate buffer is used but we have recommended acetate buffer and once it is um, uh, extracted then it can be you no know, precipitated because these are basically protein in nature these can be precipitated uh, by a fractional precipitation using ammonium sulfate dialyzed and after dialysis is they can be you no know, uh, purified with a one step anion exchange process which is there and uh, this particular process uh, uh, economical process has been devised uh, one of my phd students hilal chakdar he worked on this and uh, basically we also you no know, characterize different organisms and uh, just to mention that uh, a purity of 0.7 or more is good for its use for food feed as well as for uh, cosmetics and if the purity goes beyond 2.5 then it can be used for uh, uh, pharmaceutical purpose and if purity goes beyond 3.5 it can be used for analytics and other uh, pharmaceutical applications and what you can see here is that most of these organisms which i have put here they have a very good purity even only if you don't go even up to the last step still some of the organisms have a purity more than 2.5 and then finally the purified uh, purity of 5.79 5.43 so very good purity of these organisms we could obtain by using this particular method <laughs> and this particular method was further basically improved by another uh, one of my students dia she submitted uh, last year and uh, we uh, mod modulated or modified the i would say the gradient evaluation using sodium chloride concentrations and that further improved the purification of these uh, pigments from these organisms uh, and then for this particular process we also were granted a patent uh, by government of india 
and uh, if we look into the economical aspects uh, because this is only a one step process and uh, uh, roughly we calculated that uh, this is only one tenth of the cost which is basically sold by sigma eldritch they are no uh, selling a phycocyanin of purity of about 3.5 for indian rupees uh, around 13000 uh, uh, but for our uh, process it is only costing about uh, you can say uh, 1100 rupees or so and that to the purity of more than 4.5 Uh, well the purity you can look here uh, the phycoerythrin and phycocyanin we got a single peak uh, based on their uh, uh, i would say spectrum and then further you know we characterize this uh, with sds page and the alpha and beta subunits normally for phycocyanin the molecular weight ranges from uh, 17 kilo daltons uh, to uh, 18 or 19 and for phycoerythrin it is again a bit uh, similar between 16 to 18 further we also know characterize this with uh, uh, looking for uh, the subunits identification for determining the mass with multi of ms ms analysis and we could see that um, the theoretical molecular weight and actual molecular weight they were quite uh, close together and all these organisms uh, pigments they were matching with the uh, known uh, databases Uh, well once we have uh, purified these organisms we just wanted further because uh, to commercially look into how we can improve their uh, production we started with the response surface methodology and we designed you no know, different experimental uh, i would say inputs in this and we took three uh, uh, nutrient factors the ferric ammonium citrate the potassium hydrogen phosphate and trace metals by way during their concentrations and then uh, finally we got a maximum pbb production of 0.39 mg per ml which was uh, basically obtained with this uh, and these are the interaction graphs and the results have shown a quadratic effect of uh, dipotassium hydrogen phosphate and the linear effect of other two nutrients which were used and basically uh, of course we got uh, better production with rsm but then this was further uh, subjected to what we call as genetic algorithm and fuzzy logic methodology where again 20 different fuzzy uh, i would say uh, uh, rules were created for each of the input factors resulting into output factors of phycobilly proteins uh, which was there and looking at this for each input factor again uh, five uh, these modules were created for each one uh, all these are statistically done and then these were well Validated again for interaction plots uh, uh, for all these three inputs, and basically resulting into convergence plot. And uh, we got a very good R square value of 0.939, and then uh, we got a production of 100.405. So uh, if you see here with RSM optimized, it was. Uh, uh 385 mg and further optimization was done with genetic algorithm and fuzzy logic methodology again we could increase it and finally the concentration or input concentration which we got with rsm these were further improved and we got ferric ammonium citrate of 0.153 uh, dipotassium 0.2 and trace metals of 0.5 under these concentrations we could get more than two fold increase in the production of these phycobilly proteins which was done and this particular we published in bioresource technology and further no uh, in another organism in nostock species we after rsm we again no uh, did this particular kind of statistical analysis uh, using connected neural network and multi objective genetic algorithm multi objective because here we targeted both biomass as well as phycobilly proteins and basically the best uh, network models they were fed into this multi objective genetic algorithm and then finally validated uh, for their production
and looking into this and here the beauty of this particular analysis is that we can uh, take a very big range of uh, i would say uh, concentration you can see here the ferric ammonium citrate from 3 milligrams we could go up to 150 milligrams similarly for magnesium sulfate again so big ranges can be taken up and you can see here with rsm again of course we got a better production from initial 210 to 309 and dry soil biomass was also doubled uh, but r square value was not uh, very encouraging this but then we further you no know, went into this uh, multi objective genetic algorithm and again we looked into all the uh, values of training validation and test they were all into uh, very good r square value and this was further basically uh, led to uh, this kind of a pareto uh, diagram which is giving a very uh, i would say good results of r square value which was 0.9978 and further increase we got was 340 uh, microgram per ml or 340 mg per liter which was there of course dry cell we could not increase much but then we were mainly interested in pigments this again we published in another bio resource uh, journal uh, looking into all these things you know we also wanted to know whether uh, this particular increase is also related to some gene expression and we looked into uh, different aspects of nutrients like ferric uh, uh, iron as well as light and salt concentrations and uh, you know we targeted or uh, saw the regulation of cpcb gene and what we could see that uh, among different iron sources ferric ammonium citrate was the one which was giving uh, better results and you can see here the expression of uh, this gene was much better under ferric ammonium citrate concentrations as compared to ferric chloride or ferrous sulfate similarly the light uh, conditions we took three different light conditions light intensity of 55 35 45 and 65 micromole and what we could see uh, again that um, a light intensity of about uh, you can say uh, Uh, this thirty-five uh, and in some cases sixty-five gave gave a good expression of this particular gene. And then we also tried some stress conditions, salt stress. We tried uh, different salt concentrations, uh, which were there. Point uh, zero one, of course, very mild concentrations we gave. Point zero one molar, point zero five molar, and point one molar. And what we could see that. under mild salt concentrations of 0.01 molar there was better expression of uh, this particular uh, uh, cpc b gene that resulted in better uh, pigment production uh, then you no know, once we have increased this uh, uh, production of these pigments the stability of these pigments is very much important because whenever you are uh, having any kind of application of these pigment especially for food industry its stability the oxidizing agents all these are very much important and what we could see these are the isolates from uh, diverse uh, i would say locations which were there and what we could see that the pigment or the phycocyanin which we this cr is the residual uh, concentration of the pigment which is left and <laughs> what we could see that for medium mole which was also giving much better uh, i would say production of this pigment and uh, it uh, normally you know commercially available pigment which is available is mostly from spirulina and what we could see here that this for medium mole could uh, uh, outsmart spirulina also it was giving much more production than spirulina and then it was also uh, comparatively stable to temperature up to even 80 degree celsius and had a wide ph range uh, where it was stable between 4 to 8 but uh, at acidic ph it was more stable whether we talk about for medium pigment or plectonema or another for medium species which, which we could take but as uh, far as oxidizing agent is concerned the better stability was observed in nostoc calcicola followed by uh, plectonema species uh, 
well then further we looked into you know what can be the you no know, uh, genetic aspects of this and uh, normally what we could see that uh, we uh, sequenced both cpc b as well as cpc a genes of these non heterosexual cultures and then we compared it with the available databases and then what we could see that uh, the highest similarity which you could get with thermoleptolingbia species which is again a, a thermo tolerant species and we could basically uh, uh, look into some of the hot spots and in fact we are trying to look into a particular amino acids which are responsible for uh, the thermal stability because all these uh, pigments if you have seen my earlier slide of sts page where molecular weight determination was done uh, their molecular weight varies from organism to organism and that is because the amino acid uh, composition also varies and uh, that is also responsible for the stability of these uh, pigments so looking into that we are looking uh, that which particular amino acid is basically responsible for more or uh, better thermal stability of these particular pigments so that some kind of uh, modulations can be done to replace that particular maybe single nucleotide to give us uh, that uh, changes in the pigment uh, well then we also because uh, uh, were interested to upscale the pigment production and we compared uh, normally because these are photosynthetic organisms and uh, they can very well grow outside also and based upon uh, what is the intended use of application of these pigments they can be produced in a photobioreactor or they can be produced outside uh, in trays or maybe in raceways okay so based on that what we could see we compared the production in photobioreactor and trays what we could see that the biomass more or less remained same whether it was photobioreactor or uh, it was a tray uh, there was a little increase in the biomass production after 25 days but what we could see for uh, phycobilly proteins production after 20 days of incubation there was a sharp increase in pigment production when it was grown in photobioreactor under controlled conditions as compared to open trays in a glass house uh then we uh, no further looked into uh, because we got the lead that uh, mild salt concentration can increase the production so we no uh, added the salt and there was about 13 uh, percent increase in the production of phycobilly proteins with the addition of uh, sodium chloride and then uh, we also grew it in the raceways and we devised a specific uh, economical medium uh, for its production and of course this study uh, we are at the concluding stages uh, the composition of the medium uh, i have not revealed here but couple of medium uh, which uh, we i am showing here is uh, having a, a very good uh, production of these phycobilly proteins so that was about phycobilly proteins another work which we have been carrying out is on spirulina spirulina you all know is uh, uh, i would say the most nutritive nutritive uh, uh, organism uh it is a green food and 1 gram of spirulina they say is equal to consuming 1 uh, kg of assorted vegetables and fruits so uh, of course spirulina has uh, all these uh, very important and very essential uh, nutrients in it whether we talk about proteins the vitamins the iron the calcium the pigments antioxidants the essential uh, i would say pufa fatty acids and of course carotenoids which are there uh, this is the basic compo chemical composition of spirulina powder of course there can be variations the important thing is that the nucleic acid content is very less so they can be used as single cell protein also and the protein varies from 60 to 70% of its dry biomass uh, 
uh, and then it is its proteins are called complete proteins because all the essential amino acids are enough of course all the 20 amino acids are there in the protein which is there in the spirulina uh, of course it is a good source of vitamin b12 of course we have not worked much on this uh, vitamin b12 but we looked into that how we can basically increase the pufa content the gamma linolenic acid content in these organisms we have a good collection of different spirulina strains and these three selected strains we could see that uh, if we again give a uh, NACL concentration of about uh, 4 grams or 5 grams, uh, then there is more production of gamma linolenic acid, which we could see in these organisms. And further, um, uh, the ratio of gamma linolenic acid to total fatty acids that also increased, even other unsaturated fatty acids to total fatty acids, all these things showed a very good increase uh, with these um, uh, modulations of this. Then further nutrient modulation we did with the use of sodium nitrate. And again, we could uh, increase the gamma linolenic acid uh, uh, at, uh, you can say, um, a lower concentration of sodium nitrate, uh, which is there. And similarly, the resulting, uh, you can see here uh, that uh, unsaturated fatty acid increase could be seen at 1.5 grams per liter as compared to the normal concentration. Uh, well, then we also looked into or we developed maybe of some interest to the food scientists or the post harvest ones. We developed some spirulina enriched functional foods and all these functional foods, uh, they were found to have increased nutritive value, whether we talk about proteins, antioxidants, whether we talk about minerals, all these things, flavonoids, phenol content, all these things increased uh, and they were stable enough. And the sensory evaluation was also done on a hedonic scale. And uh, these were very much liked by the panelists they, who consumed it. And uh, this particular study we published in uh, uh, Foods Journal. Uh, then uh, we also developed a spirulina fortified yogurt uh, and with the use of uh, commercial, I would say, uh, probiotic strains as well as the spirulina using different concentration, 1%, 2.5% and 4%. And what we could see again, there was a, a nutritional enhancement, whether we talk about proteins, the antioxidants or the minerals which are there, uh, there was good uh, increase in this. And when we... Uh, the biophysical examination also what we could see uh, because these are very important for a um, preparation like yogurt and what we could see that 1% of spirulina preparation or fortification was uh, acceptable uh, for sensory evaluation as well as for their biophysical nature of consistency as well as synergies and acidity of course was more with the higher concentrations with some interaction of spirulina and the probiotic strains. Um, and what we could, you can see here, the sensory evaluation in terms of color, aroma, taste, mouthfeel, and shininess. And what we, you can see here, that 1% spirulina uh, fortification was uh, equivalent to control, uh, but was better nutritionally. Uh, but then further, uh, I would say, fortification uh, was not very much acceptable. Uh, we did work, uh, one of my students also worked on biofuels, uh, especially the biodiesel aspect of uh, uh, cyanobacteria, of course, uh, other kind of microalgae are more, uh, uh, I would say, suited for this particular kind of activity. But what we did a study looking into some of the, uh, I would say, mechanism aspects of it or uh, how it is being regulated. And of course, because these organisms are easy to grow, so maybe uh, they are also good candidates for biodiesel production. And uh, this is one of the quote uh, long back, given all futuristic energy technologies may become reality someday, thanks to the work of the smallest living creatures on earth, that is 
microorganisms and that is coming true uh, of course uh, the microalgae have a lot of advantages where uh, they can be used as biodiesel and of course in a biorefinery approach where rest of the material can be used as a protein feed or maybe as a biofertilizer or some kind of uh, other byproducts biochemicals or other things well what we did we took uh, different cyanobacteria and, and we looked into how the accd gene is regulated by different again modulation of uh, nutrients and uh, what we took with there were two organisms sp8 and sp18 that is oscillatoria species and microcolia species and we uh, basically looked into the protein structure as well as regulation of this particular gene under different and nutrient conditions and what we could see that um, basically the expression of this particular gene was found to increase significantly under low uh, nitrogen uh, input that is 6 millimolar sodium nitrate concentration and there was about 12 fold increase in the expression of this gene whereas uh, of course there was a variable expression uh, under different phosphorus concentrations but again what we could see that uh, uh, 5 molar concentration, uh, the expression 139 fold increase expression was there. So such kind of uh, modulations can be very helpful in increasing the production of lipids in these organisms. Uh, we also looked into the uh, protein structure of both uh, microcolius as well as oscillatoria and what we could uh, uh, gather from this that uh, both have a different kind of a structural uh, uh, existence uh, with one having no beta sheets whereas uh, the other one is having alpha helices sheets as well as beta sheets and um, uh, this particular protein of microcolius is smaller than one but then it is more stable as compared to the uh, other one. So sp18 protein was found more stable than sp8 with the occurrence of beta sheets in its secondary structure. And then more, many more studies were done for this and this was published in Biotechnology for Biofuels. Uh, well, another uh, important aspect which we are regularly working is that, uh, of course, uh, all of you know the contribution of cyanobacteria in agriculture as a biofertilizer. It's an important input for better crop nutrient management in soil. Uh, of course, blue-green algae uh, uh, are uh, conducive to uh, the uh, rice conditions are conducive to the growth of these organisms. So that's why and they fix atmospheric nitrogen. And that is why now these organisms are, uh, I would say, a recommended practice in uh, integrated nutrient farming as well as in organic farming and besides uh, the nitrogen fixation which is uh, uh, i would say one of the aspects which as a layman uh, or as a student of biology every student might know that yes cyanobacteria are used in agriculture because they uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen but besides fixing nitrogen they have many other uh, uses many other applications which i have listed here uh, they improve uh, i would say physical chemical and biological health of the soil uh, by producing lot many polysaccharides which leads to soil aggregation uh, also the carbon uh, soil carbon also increases uh, and then they also uh, release uh, i would say uh, these um, uh, uh, plant growth promoters as well as they increase the pea availability and we have done again extensive work on uh, uh, solubilization of phosphorus by cyanobacteria uh, of course uh, the chelation effect also uh, leads to decrease in the iron toxicity and then because these are phototrophic organisms they grow there they die there and it becomes food for the heterotrophic microorganisms and they also flourish they also multiply so they also help in increasing the soil microbial population in a particular soil where these are applied so multiple benefits of their use in agriculture and what we have seen that their continuous use uh, basically leads to sustainability of the uh, productivity of the soil uh, 
of course um, and we had a, earlier a method traditional ways of production of this uh, biofertilizer but then uh, looking at the technological aspects of course uh, it is easy to produce this but then the earlier process which was there that was uh, only i would say uh, possible to grow these organisms for few months if it is it, it was an open air production kind of thing soil based culture where contamination issues were also there so we looked into the process optimization and we uh, tried to develop some indoor production protocols in a poly house and then we replaced soil as a carrier uh, we replaced it with another carrier and then uh, bulky requirement was there about uh, 12 to 15 kilogram was required per hectare which was very difficult for farmers to take it to use it or maybe difficult for uh, even industry or commercial houses houses to produce it in that big amount and then store it all those uh, drawbacks were there so we looked into all those things and then we uh, uh, developed this process of ready to use quality material with reduced volume and not now what we are recommending is 500 grams per acre of the material so that is easy to take away easy to transport easy to use and it is also has a commercial look uh, this is the pilot scale facility which uh, i developed under one of the projects at iari at our center and then we are regularly producing and giving it to the farmers uh, this particular uh, process which we have uh, optimized is we have a culture we take it to the production tank uh, we take the biomass mix it with the carrier and then we assess the quality at all the stages and then uh, packaging is done and then it can be stored and this material has a shelf life of more than 2 years at room temperature Uh, well we have calculated throughout the year it can be produced under delhi conditions this is the data for uh, delhi and you can see here um, uh, there is more production during summer months of april to june and the duration of harvest is also less and the duration increases with the i would say when the temperature goes down and production also decreases but then it is economically viable and one can have production throughout the year and based on this Uh, of course i will not go into the recommendations uh, of course this is all known to all the the students who are here uh, well we have carried out lot many trials this is just a glimpse of the one of uh, the slides lot many trials we have carried out in and around delhi pan india we had a project where our all biofertilizers which are produced by iari they are used um, in different locations and uh, we have got the results for that and you can see here the the yield increases varies and there is a nitrogen saving also uh, then we have tried different combinations with the chemical fertilizer without chemical fertilizer uh, then uh, how it basically is affecting the farmers income all these data is available and extensive uh, uh, demonstration trials have been carried out by myself uh, also uh, during my this because being in an agricultural institute this is the prime thing which we look into and then this is uh, again we looked into that how basically different uh, 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 this uh, management practices are uh, affected by input of uh, different uh, i would say organic inputs including blue green algae the organic uh, concept of farming the inm the chemical and what you can see here the different varieties which have been taken and you can see here that uh, the yield is is much more uh, i would say advantageous under organic farming followed by inm farming as compared to the chemical inputs uh, well we also looked into the quality of the grains as well as straw and again we could see that um, the quality or the nutritional value in terms of nitrogen protein and phosphorus was better whether it was organic or inm as compared to chemical ones uh 
some of the minerals uh, also we looked into iron zinc manganese copper and other things and the results were all encouraging for uh, different organic uh, as well as inm this is another uh, very extensive uh, uh, study which we carried out with the because we have licensed uh, this particular technology to six companies and those companies are also producing this biofertilizer and selling it to different parts of the country and this particular uh, survey we carried out uh, in Punjab, UP and Haryana uh, uh, about the farmers that uh, uh, what kind of land holdings they have how much area is being used under BGA, what kind of farmers are ready to use uh, the blue green algae biofertilizer and what we could see that the semi medium and medium farmers, they were quite, uh, I would say, interested and uh, uh, wanted to use this or took this particular technology because uh, the large farmers, they were not much worried. They have enough uh, money for uh, chemical inputs, but the marginal and small farmers, uh, uh, they have a, a kind of a, uh, I would say, thinking that uh, whatever they are doing, that's okay. They don't want to take the risks. But this group of semi-medium and medium farmers are the ones which are trying to innovate and trying to look for the new technologies. So this uh, kind of a survey this kind of a analysis is not only for this particular technology any kind of technology which you develop you need to target this group which is ready to innovate and ready to take the risk so that kind of a finding which we got from this and this particular study we published in three biotech we also looked into the uh, savings as well as uh, analysis uh, all statistical done and uh, this particular study was quite helpful in further you know uh, taking up this uh, with the, the farmers as well as what kind of inputs can be you know reduced or can be uh, just uh, modulated by use of blue green algae biofertilizer uh, this is again some of the feedback which we got from the farmers uh, of course many of the things are not really documented but then uh, even looking at the crop how the crop looks how uh, some of the things like early harvested uh, maybe less irrigation these things are not counted so we need to look into the holistic analysis that every such small thing counts for the farmer Okay, if the thing has been early harvested, he gets more time for preparation of his field and other things. If irrigation, one irrigation is less, that saves money. If weeding is not done, that also saves money. So, so many things are there which are not reported. So, we uh, did actually, um, we also did uh, a study with the ITC company for uh, about 10 years together. They take took this particular technology for analysis and a very systematic study was done. Of course, those results I'm not showing here, but then all those things or analysis has been done for this. So this particular technology we have licensed to these six companies in last six or seven years and uh, they are also producing and uh, the BGA use has been spread to many, many uh, new areas and uh, about thousands of uh, hectares have been covered and that has been reported also in one of the, uh, I would say, uh, reports of our director in, in a convocation address. Uh, well, then we also looked into that uh, how commercially different companies are uh, basically trying to promote their product, especially the BGA product, which is there. And this particular study again was done the successful uh, adoption of this particular technology. Again, we published in Journal of Applied Phycology that the manufacturer either forms a, a traditional uh, you know, uh, way of uh, reaching to the farmer by giving it to the district head then area in charge block officer then progressive farmers are the ones which basically promote it to other farmers if the progressive farmers are using it then other farmers they see it and do it but then uh, some of them they um, formed a cooperative society and then reach the farmer and then there is another approach of distributor dealer and then going to the farmer so all these different approaches were taken up by the 
different commercial houses for promoting their product. Uh, well, then uh, uh, we also developed a uh, BGA based composite liquid formulation uh, providing nitrogen and phosphorus and this liquid formulation has been uh, formed and it has been tested extensively uh, in last three years and this product is also now ready for commercialization. This 100 ml is uh, sufficient for one acre of uh, uh, rice growing area. Again, we uh, did a comparative study of both carrier based as well as liquid formulation. Lot many demonstrations have been conducted are and are being conducted every year. And uh, uh, you can see here that there is about 11% uh, increase which we they got uh, with the use of either of these uh, on an average uh, which is there and these are being uh, uh, now continuously uh, taken up. So I think uh, uh, this is the impact of the technology. Uh, rice is grown in about 43 million hectares in the country. And if this biofertilizer is applied in about 25% of rice growing area, it will give a saving of about 4.3 million tons of chemical fertilizer nitrogen by contributing on an average 20 kilogram nitrogen per hectare. This is... Uh, 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 on the lower side we have taken and with the application of this biofertilizer a farmer can save up to in 350 per hectare on chemical fertilizer and with yield increase of about 10 percent or so can get another additional benefit of 2000 rupees which i showed in the earlier slide here the increase in farmers income uh, about 9000 per hectare and with the liquid about 7 point uh, 7300 per hectare so that is there so uh, i think that is all which i wanted to say of course these cyanobacteria they constitute the most important component of the biosphere and extensive research on basic and applied aspects has demonstrated its unparalleled potential for various applications which i have listed some of those applications we have worked upon and of course uh, this algal biomass is a feedstock for many of these products but the only thing is that if you have seen whether we talk about uh, some enriched products whether we talk about uh, uh, the pigments all these things they require a multidisciplinary approach it is not that uh, as a microbiologist one can uh, take up all these things but then that will give you many more options to uh, basically target these organisms okay and then um, as bj biofertilizer everyone knows uh, is an integral part of agriculture. They enhance soil organic carbon, available nutrients, microbial population, enzymatic activity of soil, making it sustainable and more productive. And of course, uh, their cultivation is very economical, environmentally safe. So these organisms uh, are, I would say, the front runners for biotechnological applications. So looking at all this, uh, still more challenges are there. The students who are listening, who are viewing this, the industry is still in infancy. Accomplishments have been modest. There is lack of adequate technological base because finally we have to come out with some kind of a commercial product and other things. And there are so many, I would say, things to do. Uh, process control is required, contaminating problems because if you have to go for mass production, it is done outside. Uh, all those things need to be looked into. So there is a high scope of research on these organisms uh, and one can take it up further. So with that, I acknowledge uh, my students, my colleagues for uh, you know, contributing to all the I would say research activities which I have you no know, just uh, talked about. Uh, so thank you very much. Some of group of students which are presently there. So that is all from my side. Any uh, clarifications? Anything we would like to know, uh, madam? Uh, I would say there is no as such correlation 
heterocystis cyanobacteria or non heterocystis cyanobacteria the only thing what we have seen is uh, of course we have investigated it quite extensively uh, the non heterocystis ones do produce uh, more pigment uh, what we could see but then modulation is more uh, easy in heterocystis cyanobacteria to maximize it to produce it more and then uh, what we could see that uh, uh, normally these uh, uh, pigments the phycobilly proteins i am talking they are released by a simple process of freezing and thawing from the organisms what we could see that uh, the non heterocystis ones they require more cycles of freezing and thawing as compared to the heterocystis ones okay otherwise as such uh, it's not that uh, some kind of a correlation exists but definitely uh, what we could see that uh, the for medium the plectonema the spirulina they are better producers naturally uh normally the reports are even up to 15 percent 20 percent uh, but uh, we don't get it once you purify it it's normally five percent seven percent like that here economically direct sunlight is much better but biomass more or less remains same if you have seen those slides the biomass remained more or less same the pigment production increased uh, in uh, under controlled conditions upper one is biomass so of course uh, under controlled conditions it will always be more uh, once you have controlled conditions uh, under open conditions uh, there will be a stage after which the biomass will start no uh, kind of a plateau okay but in a photobioreactor because uh, all the time the conditions are such that uh, uh, all optimized conditions are there but then again you see uh, till 20 days it is more or less same then a little increase is there okay but the pigment production it goes up because of the Uh, controlled condition actually ferric ammonium citrate is a part of uh, is a component of the yeah. medium which is used yeah so we just thought that uh, let us try other sources also ferrous sulfate and fer ferric chloride but then what we could see that ferric ammonium citrate uh, uh, is uh, was doing good but the only thing is what we could uh, see that maybe and uh, the iron which is supplied by ferric ammonium citrate is uh, uh, easily you know uh, available to the organism and maybe the citrate uh, is also helping as a carbon source or something with that and one, another is about the dna contamination for your pigments and neutraceuticals do you have any experience that when you do or did you any uh, did any experiment on dna contamination on your products uh, dna contamination no uh, normally we are uh, when purifying it we are using fractionation by ammonium sulfate okay. so that doesn't uh, really take the dna with it only protein comes yeah uh, dr kumuda you know right ha huh, yes she is in at madurai she okay. want to ask some question sure sure sure, sure. yeah ma'am kumuda ma'am hello sir good morning sir uh, yeah. sir did you estimate the uh, polysaccharide production that is any variation in uh, eps production sir in your cultures i i it's not i it is not clear what what estimation eps what? sir eps eps uh, yeah eps uh, uh, we have not worked on eps but ah. one of my colleagues is working on eps production 
Okay. Uh, yes, EPS production is another aspect which is uh, very much, uh, I would say, uh, good for these organisms. They really produce good EPS, but I have not worked as such. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Radha Prasanna is there, one Dr. Tiwadi is there. And uh, she okay. developed that uh, EPS with other organisms. That is a biofilm. Huh? Yeah, like uh -huh. a biofilm. Yes, biofilm. Uh, so they make it like a consortium. Ah, uh, yes, it's yes. The EPS of cyanobacteria. Yes, yes, yeah. that is it's there. Not, and EPS as such also, no, uh, it has been no, used. Uh, EPS has a role in uh, uh, soil yeah. conditioning as well as uh, even for biocontrol, it has been reported, mm -hmm. depending upon the kind of uh, this uh, polysaccharide it is. Yeah. But as personally, madam, uh, I have not worked on that. Oh, okay. Thanks. We are working on the church, so that's why we are. Oh, that's good. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Normally, chlorella should not behave like that. Uh, chlorella are supposed to be thermotolerant in many ways. Uh, but if it is like that, it, the only thing is that you need to look into a uh, couple of things one is that uh, is there uh, some nutrient depletion occurring so maybe uh, this one aspect you can check okay. uh, another is that if you can somehow uh, do some kind of a you know uh, stirring in the system uh, because direct uh, exposure uh, may be harming it okay and that can be you know uh, one of the aspects otherwise you no know, i understand that uh, when temperature is more and uh, uh, of course uh, uh, that thing there, there can there is a contamination uh, also there is a growth of uh, parasite try no uh, try to uh, give a little heavy inoculum okay sir. Okay. heavy inoculum and then uh, maybe um, if it is possible to have a continuous harvesting kind of system where you uh, harvest it and uh, fed back uh, sort of ha -ha, that kind of a thing if it can be done okay. otherwise if you leave it idle uh, this will happen yeah. we are uh, shaking it also still uh, it is getting bleached we are unable to maintain mm. uh, cultures. Okay. Have you checked it in the laboratory? It's, laboratory uh, it's not a problem. No, no, it's stability at certain temperature. Yes, sir. Uh, up to 35 inside uh, room temperature, it grows ah. without any loss. But when it is like exposed to light, mm. that is the problem. Direct uh -huh. sunlight. Uh, direct sunlight, maybe uh, high light intensity. Uh, that is why I said if it is being circulated, then uh, maybe uh, circulation. Uh, it's been extensively tested. Lot many reports are there. Phycobilly proteins as uh, anti-cancer, uh, all those things are there. Uh, but maybe the red algae are the ones which uh, they are using the marine red algae uh, because they also contain phycobilly proteins. Uh, I think maybe uh, the only thing is that uh, uh, the production, they are getting the natural production or maybe uh, bo good biomass. Uh, and then uh, most of the products which are available, they are outside, not from India. And the reason is that uh, uh, in other countries, uh, they don't have much sun. So they are more into marine products or marine organisms, whereas uh, that is why I'm saying that here we need to, our conditions are such that uh, these things can really uh, go to any, I would say, level with uh, so much uh, natural light available, economically it will be very feasible. That may be the reason. Otherwise, uh, there is no uh, chemically uh, no advantage. Uh, hydrogen, the government is promoting in a big way. Uh -huh. Cyanobacteria have a role to play in every, even for microbial fuel cells and all those things. <laughs> Therefore, uh, 
yes. Uh, now, like for electric vehicles, the only thing is that um, uh, the uh, I would say the logistics which are required, those need to be created. If we talk about you no know, CNG, there was a time that only very few filling stations were there, but now the things have improved. So uh, maybe for electric vehicles also uh, things may improve, but then again, long distance uh, traveling and other things, uh, I don't know how the things shape up. Uh, but uh, definitely electric vehicles, in my opinion, they have a future. Yes. Oh no, yes, everybody has a different opinion and everybody is uh, free to talk. Uh, so I think electric vehicles will be, uh, uh, yes. For hydrogen, the only thing is uh, storage. I don't know, storage problem is there and uh, if they are able to manage that somehow because uh, uh, in a country like india uh, we have a mixed uh, uh, communities where illiterate people are there uh, so all those things are there and then uh, we have to be you know very much uh, 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 foolproof kind of a system where this uh, kind of uh, energy is used which BJ trial, BJ trial, it is a composite. Yes, yes, it's a mixed culture. Four organisms together. Uh, this is Nostoc, Anabina, Olocera, and Tolipotrix. Uh, and the liquid formulation has five. It has another Vestal Opsis also. The P solubilizer. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. We have increased the biomass load. Yes. No, no, we are producing in tanks only. Ah, the biomass which is there, that is lifted. And uh, then that is mixed with the carrier. Carrier we are using is uh, popularly called Multani Mitti. Ah, Fuller's Earth, that we are using. The liquid formulation, the need is that uh, uh, basically, you know, uh, this liquid formulation, it has an easy delivery system. Uh, if you have to, because uh, if you have a 500 gram packet, that needs to be mixed with four to five kilograms of soil. Okay. And then it is to be broadcast. Okay? And liquid formulation is such that uh, it can be put in the irrigation channel also, and it will spread. Secondly, it revives easily. It revives easily. And, and then uh, third thing is that uh, looking at the demand. Looking at the demand that people wanted liquid formulation. That is there. Pardon? Ah. Yes, yes, it is preferred by the farmers. It is preferred by the farmers. Pardon? Dose 100 ml for one acre. Cost, uh, we have not decided yet. Last uh, three years, we are giving it free of cost to the farmers. Uh, but uh, normally, it is not costing much. We are not adding any cell protectant or anything in this. This is, uh, uh, I would say, oil-based formulation. I have not shown here all the, I would say, uh, the physical behavior of this. As soon as we put it uh, in water, it disperses like anything. So uh, its spreading is very good. That is another thing which we are uh, uh, putting into this formulation. So cost wise, very economical. I feel happy and immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks. And first, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude and thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor for this great initiative uh, for the deliverance of guest lecture, just for the benefit of the students and for the staff members. 
and next i would like to thank our uh, dean spgs for the permission granted to conduct the viva and followed by the guest lecture through hy hybrid mode in this academy hall uh, for the smooth delivery and next uh, my sincere thanks to our hod uh, for his support to conduct this fifth guest lecture for the benefit of the students and i also extend my sincere thanks to our uh, professor and head in charge madam other professors and other senior professors colleagues uh, for attending this uh, guest lecture and viva and make it is make it as a successful event and finally i i wish to extend my sincere gratitude and thanks to uh, dr sunil bappi sir for his thought provoking lecture and he gave a new idea for the ex for the exploitation of this blue green algae in addition to as biofertilizer and as a biofuel uh, here so far we are concentrating a uh, blue green algae on uh, biofertilizer and uh, biofuel aspect only uh, today we gained uh, some knowledge towards the ex exploiting uh, blue green algae for uh, pigment extraction thank you so much sir and uh, finally i i thank all our uh, pg and phd students for attending and uh, this uh, viva and guest lecture thank you so much